Messiah. He's not, he did, uh, Patrick Byrne did not ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, but it is his first trip to the Holy Land. And I hope he's enjoyed his visit so far, and he's now on our stage. Uh, Patrick Byrne, um, uh, founder of Overstock, CEO, Executive Chairman of Overstock, and Gerald, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Jeff is really the great rabbi of this movement, and I hope you listen to him. I will be coming back to Jeff. <coughs> Uh, when I was 15, I read a line in the Torah. Don't ask what a 15-year-old guy named Patrick Michael Xavier O'Byrne was doing reading the Torah, but I was reading the Torah. And there's a line in the book of in the Sefer volume, which we call, that all the boys call Deuteronomy, about, about a line that perplexed me. And it was uh, a line that said, it, <coughs> Moving a boundary marker between two properties was a sin worse than murder. And I remember being quite surprised by that. Like, why would I like thinking about it for a while? Well, my first opportunity to meet a rabbi, which came because I was a country boy from New Hampshire, came, came some years later before I met my first Jewish person and to introduce me to a rabbi. I asked about that line. And he explained to me this worldview. <coughs> that says, that was, well, if you're with a group of people and you've come out into the, into the wilderness and you're gonna be building civilization out of the, you know, out of the wilderness, and we're all in it together, and one amongst us is doing things like moving that property line, it's not just a transgression against the neighbor, it's, a, it's an offense against the whole project, our whole collective project, moving civilization forward made sense to me. The, uh, and also where I come from, Robert Frost, the great national poet, he was then national poet laureate under Kennedy, had a, had a great poem, Mending Fences, that said uh, with a line, good fences make good neighbors. And again, same instinct is expressed. This idea that we can't, you know, really all progress comes when we cooperate, ultimately. And if there are fuzzy boundaries and fuzziness in, uh, in, our, in the terms of our, of our uh, cooperation or our property and such, that's just a big energy drain off what we can collaborate and build together. Uh, in America, there's this political discussion that comes around every election season. It's some kind of litmus test for some people. Are corporations persons, or you want to, I guess Mitt Romney, said corporations and persons too or something and everybody freaked out. That's not, how can that be? And I'm crazy. That's, well, of course, corporate. Well, corporations, you can call anything you want, but it's a form of basically whatever society, the laws that they write about what kinds of corporations you can form are essentially laws about how we're going to cooperate. You can restrict that as much as you want. The more you're restricted, you're just restricting the ways we can cooperate to do things. Uh, the great advent of security law. Well, here's, here's the problem, though, that has occurred in, in my view, in the, in the United States anyway, when we speak to other countries, but in the formation of capital that supports corporations, that support, in other words, the way we capitalize how we cooperate. <coughs> and that is, uh, and this, that is that the system, system came off track in the 1970s. And how that came about is you know, we, Wall Street used to be a place where people were under a tree and they traded stock certificates. By the 1900s, it wasn't like it was you know, more formal. By the 1930s, it was Wall Street was guys on bicycles riding around with burlap stacks of stock over their shoulder and, and affecting delivery. So if, I, if my brokerage had a client that sold 100 shares of IBM to a client of your brokerage, I'm selling you a sack each day, and there are stock certificates, and there were these very complicated systems of how you cut corner on the stock certificates, and it was like this whole code. Well, in the 1960s, the volume on Wall Street quadrupled, and all the guys on bicycles log jam, they couldn't keep up, it was like a database log jam. And the SEC, and there were some major brokers that actually went under, just like a database that got hung up, you know, there were some brokers in America, significant brokers actually, that were bankrupt because of it. 
And there was actually a two year, three year period on Wall Street where they only traded uh, uh, four days a week and limited hours each day. And it was called the Great Wall Street Paperwork Crisis. And it was a chance to give the guys on bicycles a chance to catch up. The SEC called the industry together in 1971. They said, we have to fix this. There were two possible solutions proposed. One was, let's have a peer-to-peer -peer electronic settlement system among the brokerage houses. The other solution proposed was something that had been tried in Austria in the 1860s. It was called uh, Central Counterparty Clearing. And that is, let's say, let's pick one vault, and we're gonna move all the stock to that vault. And then we're just gonna have that vault issue like chits or markers or representations of the stock into the system, and that's what we, like a casino market, and that's what gets traded. Well, that's what we adopted, and has become the model all over the world. I'm not familiar with the Israeli stock market, but in every other country I've been in and looked into it, this is how everybody sort of modeled us. That ends up with this really pernicious situation, which is, uh, I, who here owns any, raise your hand if you own any stock in any public company in America. All of us with our hands up are incorrect. We actually own no stock. All the stock of all corporate America is owned by a company you've probably never heard of. It's called CD and Company, C-E-D-E. -E. Now this may sound lunatic, but you go Google this. This is all true. From the 1970s, all the legal ownership of corporate America is in one company no one's ever heard of. And it has, it has markers out to the DTCC which has basically thing that I use. I use the call share entitlements to the DTCC, and then there's a ring of brokers who are connected to the DTCC, and they get share entitlements, and then other brokers are connected to them. So, so if, you, if you get your, your Charles Schwab account, and it tells you you own 100 shares of IBM, if you really read all the legalese and upside down, backwards and Greek and such on the third page, you'll find you really don't have 100 shares. What you have are, you have a set of 100 IOUs from a broker who himself has IOUs from another broker who has IOUs from an organization called the DTCC, which has IOUs from this vault in New Jersey. That, and I'm not talking about it just custodians. It legally owns everything. Well, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> so listen, it was just didn't come out of a burning bush. It was just invented and by us. And and by the way, the decision at the time, in 1971, was while electronic peer-to-peer -peer settlement among brokerage houses would be preferred. This, this technology wasn't ready yet, and they the SEC mandated the second solution as the solution the U.S. would adopt as a temporary solution as a temporary solution. But as Milton Friedman said, nothing is so permanent as a temporary government solution. <laughs> and in 1978, it was made permanent. There was an SEC, I think it was a, the SEC hired somebody, I think it was an ex-judge named Pollock, to, uh, in the late 80s to study this. And he wrote this report called the Pollock Report. And it would tell you exactly what's wrong with the system, which is all, there's all kinds of ways, all kinds of mischief that can occur in it and it has systemic vulnerability. And incidentally, it's been whitewashed out of history. But what happened, so <clears throat> uh, I got into this because in 2002, we went public. And when you're a public company CEO, you're kind of out there in the mix. And I was out there with hedge funds and regulators and you know banks, private workers and stuff. And I started smelling much mischief. And it wasn't that hard because it was really a matter of people after they got to know me, taking me to dinner, various hedge fund type guys, and basically one form or another of the conversation, hey kid, if you're willing to play ball, we can make a lot of money together. And I did what I thought anyone would do, or what I thought 98% of people would do, which was, well, you're not, you know, are you in your mind? And, and a lot of the games that I started learning about were games that, that had to do with tricks in the settlement system. And there were various tricks in this, in this crazy settlement system I described that let people do, get up to no good, Meshigas. And they got up to some craziness and they, uh, anyway. So I started trying to do something about it. And it was kind of funny, there was a, 
here then around 2005 to 2008 when I became this very hated guy. In fact, somebody sat me down once on Wall Street and told me a very respectful guy, older statesman of the hedge fund industry, sat me down in January 2007 and said, you know, Patrick, you're, I want you to know you're literally the most hated man I've ever known in my entire life. You used to be kind of the golden boy on Wall Street, but now you can kill people, and we wouldn't hate you in this town like we hate you now. <laughs> and, but, you know, the gen I came out publicly in 04, 05, and started saying there's big flaws in this system, there's some no good nicks messing around in it. The SEC is not really protecting us, they seem to be too close to Wall Street, and I see enormous risks of systemic failure enormous possibility of systemic failure. And after I came out and started saying this kind of stuff, I, like the New York Post, used to run photos of me with UFOs coming out of my head because I had this crazy conspiracy theory that the SEC was in bed with Wall Street and weren't protecting us. Conspiracy theory, conspiracy theory. <laughs> of course, the New York Post, I would like to say it's for people who move their lips when they read Entertainment Weekly. <laughs> uh, so anyway, after 2008, people stopped laughing and running pictures of me with UFOs coming in my head. And it's been whitewashed out of history that the, what actually happened on September 15, 2008, is our settlement system froze. The DTCC froze. Nobody knew who they could trade with anymore. Exactly. I hate to say I told you so. But exactly, I basically poured kerosene on myself and lit myself on fire on the steps of the SEC since 2004, telling them that was going to happen. So after that, everybody sort of stopped laughing. But anyway, this thing has come along where we can have what was dreamed of originally, which was the, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic settlement system. And the beauty of it, as Jeff pointed out, is it doesn't, it allows much more sophisticated forms of cooperation among us than has ever been the case. I'm gonna walk you through one example that I particularly like, because I think it, it's, I mean, all these different people are coming to us, 50 different models for how they want to do a security token. The point is you can tie them not just to like common stock, you're basically getting a share of the bottom line of a company, but you can tie it to all kinds of other things, aspects of the supply chain, tie it to the top line, tie it to, so, one, the investors can have it, something different to invest in than I want to share with the bottom line. And why that will be good for capital formation is it enables the types of cooperation that have never been anticipated. Let me give you an example. <coughs> There's a car called the Elio car, E-L-I-O, a 36-year Detroit engineer. Got, I think around 2008 or 2009 saw what was said, I want to come up, and this is the kind of thing I would think, I wouldn't, it's the kind of thing I would have expected to see emerge in Israel before in the United States, but I'm very proud that this is a very clever company. Uh, the guy said, I'm going to design a car, you know, he, he's, he has designed a car, and he's worked with uh, Ralph, which is this big Detroit engineering firm that's, that's really done all the work. Uh, they designed a car that gets 84 miles to the gallon and costs $7,500 to the consumer. And there's a line, 65,000 people long. It's the, the people who want to buy this. It's a, uh, uh, a $7,500 car. It's a two-seat car, and the two seats are tandem, like a jet fighter. So it reduces aerodynamic drag. I've been in it. It's very comfortable and very cool, and everything, and it's a cool car. The uh, thing is, the guy needs $200 million to raise to, he's got a factory, a, a mothball GM factory in Shreveport, Louisiana. Needs $200 million of, that he can get for free, the factory which was shut down in 2009, that, that Shreveport would give him. And he needs $200 million in 18 months and cars will roll off the line. There are 65,000 people who have put down different deposits of different types um, for this car. In, any, in the world as we have known it today, that person's got to go to some capital provider and make his pitch and sell him on that capital provider on Sand Hill Road, which is some 32-year-old venture capitalist, is going to listen to this and really has to decide three questions. Is how big a market is there for an ultra-high mileage, very low-cost vehicle? Secondly, what share of that market is this guy going to be able to get? And then third, if he does get that market, 
is going to be able to, if it does get that revenue, is he going to be able to manage all the other lines on the income statement to have a bottom line worth, worth me wanting to share? So that's the decision maker the capital provider has to make now. Elio Coin, I'm not here to sell Elio Coin. It happens to be going on with that, but that's, I'm, I'm explaining why I'm so intrigued by this, because I think this model may, anyway, the, what they do, that you, what he's doing instead, and this was just the first S security token that's been underwritten by a bank, Jones, Jones Trading. What they're, what they're doing is saying, uh, what, and when these, we're gonna raise 200 million now, if these cars come off the assembly line in 18 months, there's gonna be a long line that's uh, stacked up. We're gonna take one in six cars as they roll off the assembly line and divert them. And they go over here, and they still sell for $77,500, but they're auctioned off, and your place in line is auctioned, and it's the, the currency of the auction is the Elo coin. So it, take, it sounds complicated, but what it does philosophically is it says, we know that there's future demand. There's already, it's the most successful crowdfunding uh, event there ever was. We, are, we know there's already demand for it. Let, uh, we, this lets them, and we know where there's demand, there's always people willing to pay to cut in line. We can monetize that now, that future demand now, and turn it into capital with which to build the thing that will let us satisfy the demand. So it's a real snake eating its tail kind of thing. Why I think that's so intriguing is that could become a model for how we fund public works, like interstates. Uh, it could be a model. Basically, economists, there's two ways to ration a scarce good, time or money. And this, and most people use time by standing in line and, and waiting for the car in that case, or money. This lets, you, you could apply this to how we build interstates and bridges. You could apply it to how you build apartment buildings, how we do pharmaceutical research. All kinds of things could harness that effect. I only mention that, probably too much length, because that's one of about two dozen models that have come our way. Now that we have this T0, we have 2,000 companies that have come our way, actually 12,000 if you include everybody, but 2,000 people that we think are real companies that we can do something with that, uh, and there must be two do dozen different models for, for the security, how they want to issue a security token. What I described is just one of them. It happens to be one that I think has some real charm. Right? It could unlock American entrepreneurship. It could be a, a, a new generation of American entrepreneurship. Uh, but, I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's a, about two dozen of these different models of how to design the security token around. And what they all do is really allow lots of strangers to find ways to cooperate that we've never been able to cooperate before. And if cooperation includes saving and investing. So it isn't just, oh, and that's what's so beautiful about this token. The, uh, in the Elio Coin case, there's really, uh, I said that the venture capitalist has to make, ask three questions to make his decision. And the Elio coin really is a proxy for two of those questions. Is there a market and how big a market can this guy Elio get? Uh, that the question, can he sell the coin, is really a question, is a proxy for those two, question, those two questions. If he can sell the coin, he can sell the car. If he can't sell the coin, he can't sell the car. And if he can sell the car, he's gonna be able to sell the coin. So, to me, I think that's less likely to allow misallocation of capital. Think of the decision and how, the, the, what are the chances that that 32-year-old venture capitalist on Sand Hill Road who looks at 500 companies a year is really gonna answer those three questions well and not misallocate capital? You gotta acknowledge there's some chance it gets misallocated and 70% of them fail. But in this case, it, it enables, what I love is about this, that project is it means they, if the guy can sell the coin, if that's a really good proxy for the other question that if he then builds the car, his business, because people want to buy the coin so they can step in front of the line and get the car. Again, that's just one of about two dozen different models that are coming out about security tokens. Jeff and his partner Steve are in, uh, sort of at the forefront of designing and, and thinking up these, uh, these kinds of models. So, uh, I th as you know, this is this is uh, Bob, what Bob Breifeld said in November, the former chair of NASDAQ, 
said, uh, in, he said 100% of the stocks and bonds being issued on Wall Street today could be issued as tokens, and in five years, 100% of the stocks and bonds will be issued as tokens. <laughs> I think he's correct, and then some. Because in five years, what's getting issued are not just stocks and bonds, which represent these very simple forms of cooperation. I have this share off your bottom line kind of thing, or the stock, but these other forms of cooperation like I just illustrated with the other car. So, uh, and lastly, <coughs> Jeff, Jeff mentioned, because uh, I wanted to leave time for a couple of questions. Jeff mentioned that there's a $3 trillion in the, uh, in the conventional world of hedge funds and such, and there's only $3 billion now over in uh, doing your crypto investing. We, we built T0 on top of, we bought a node of Wall Street that already does about 3% of the volume of Wall Street. It's a sophisticated routing and execution business called Speed Route. We bought it three, four years ago, and we built all this crypto stuff on top of it. And then in the last six months, we've become so, I think this is a world historic opportunity. We have moved a tremendous amount. We have 2,000 people in the parent of the mothership, which is overstock. We've moved 25 really elite uh, players into this T0. Point is, we're building the bridge between, or we have built really the bridge. Technologically, we're ready to go. We have, since we already have a company that routes 3% of the orders on Wall Street, by, by connecting that, and now it's connected into the world of crypto, it's, uh, I intend to be the bridge that, through which that 3 trillion can travel. So with that said, let me, let me stop and leave time for two or three quick questions. Sure. Awesome talk. Um, so you, says awesome talk. Awesome talk. You shared your perspective on the SEC's effectiveness or lack of in the context of traditional securities. What's your perspective about their stance on our industry, on tokens? Question is, I said I, I rough talked the SEC from 14 years ago. I want to say it's a different SEC, and I'm the big. I, I was the SEC's biggest critic for you know 10 years ago, 14 years ago. It's a totally different SEC, much better leadership. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm very pleased. In fact, I think they've been a little bit too hands off. I, uh, <coughs> and there is a woman who I can say is just, uh, uh, Valerie Saponic, has just, was just announced this week, has become like the czar of blockchain within the SEC. Let me tell you, I've, met, I have to have been, met her, in, you know, I'm under investigation like everybody else. This is, <laughs> In, uh, in my world, and I mean, actually, but mine was nice. I didn't get a subpoena, but they asked me to come in and talk, so I come in and talk, and super open. Uh, they're, she's real smart. Her people are really smart. They were not dealing with what I was afraid of. We're going to have a bunch of, you know, four years ago, when I would talk, frank, frankly, try to talk to bankers or other or government people about uh, crypto, people would be, or about possibilities here. People would say, uh, I mean, you give them this long, careful explanation, and they'd say, yeah, but isn't Bitcoin used to sell by ecstasy? <laughs> yeah, okay. Can we get over that? And I think U.S. dollars are used to do that, too. We don't think that, that, that makes them equal. Uh, let's, so it isn't like that now. They're really smart. She could leave and work at any blockchain company I know. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's different. I actually think in... See, I've met a bunch of times with FINRA, and we have met dozens of times with FINRA, and, and not me. I don't try not, I try, but uh, I mean, I've met FINRA, but not dozens of times. They, uh, there are people, they're not homogeneous, they're not monolithic, is what I should say. And while there was some opposition two or three years ago in those centers of power, there are other people who got, this is a regulator's dream. And regulators can't find when regulators see illegal trades, you'd think that they can just find out, well, who's behind that trade. They do something called blue sheet, and they submit a blue sheet. I want to know who's behind that trade. It turns out that the trail disappears into this mist of netting and pre-netting and slice, dice, circumcise. Nobody knows where. They can't actually track who's behind a bunch of trades. They were after 08. They were mandated by Congress to create a system that could called a consolidated audit trail. Last I hear, a billion dollars has been spent and they broke their pick on it. They're nowhere. I don't know if it's the SEC or it's, I'm sure some subcontractor. Um, so this is a regulator's dream in terms of transparency, in terms of 
uh, even systemic risk, how much capital, how much better the trading is, because you're gonna have instantaneous settlement, so you'll need pools of capital underlying and buffering things. So the regulators, a significant part of the regula regulatory apparatus, and most of it, in my mind, now sees that. And they see, uh, they see that that's, this is really the way forward for capital markets. I'm out of time. It's been a huge honor to come to Tel Aviv and speak with you. Thank you. Thank you.